So I'm going to give you some learning objectives today for, that I want to have you carry forward with you when you leave. So the first one I want you to be able to do is to articulate the rationale for embedding concepts of sex differences into cardiovascular physiology. Curricula, I want you to be able to find sex and gender. I know that was in um, Dr. Jenkins' talk, but it never hurts to repeat it at the end because we may have some different people. I want you to be able to list the three examples of how sex influences cardiovascular control mechanisms because this is directly what you would put into your curriculum material. And then finally, I want you to be able to develop a lesson plan that incorporates these concepts into cardiovascular physiology. Now, this is kind of a homework assignment because we're not going to do that during the presentation, but you should have the tools to be able to do that at the end. So, as I mentioned when I was uh, subbing for uh, Dr. Jenkins, there's some challenges in embedding concepts of sex and gender which I think are lost in translation. We actually surveyed um, our, all of our medical residents, and the pointer isn't showing up here, um, at Mayo Clinic. The response rate wasn't as great as what we might expect, but you know, residents get a lot of surveys, so it's easy to go just delete. But 16% of those that returned the, uh, the questionnaire never had an instructor or preceptor to discuss a patient's sex or gen gender that impacted uh, clinical care. We had 40% that act, ask, answered incorrectly or not sure to over half of the medical knowledge questions on sex difference. Thank you. Um, is that good? Yeah. Sex differences. And we had 60% of the female respondents and 38 of the male respondents agreed that it was important to consider sex and gender. Um, why is that? Okay, so what are some of the barriers that we had that we asked people in terms of uh, to write in their um, uh, responses? What are the barriers for you to learn these concepts? And I think once we identify the barriers, we can, we can overcome them to really make sure our students carry this material forward. So um, I, I've divided this into three classes, education, fear, and bias. So the first one is education, and that, you know, we mentioned before there's limited time to learn everything. Depending on the topic, it's only a small outcome. We don't really need to care. Who cares about it? It's a fringe, in if fringe issue. Well, hello, is a patient in front of you a male or a female? Okay. There's lack of separate brochures for men and women, and I care exclusively for women. Well, I think when we talk about brochures, that's probably patient care information, but I'm going to interpret that in a broader sense, saying that there's a lack of evidence-based medicine upon which to base um, some of those outcomes. Then we have this fear factor which is, um, if we talk about sex and gender, it's massively politicized and it can damage your career depending on um, what you might, uh, your view might be. So this strikes to me is that people really don't understand the difference between sex and gender and that we're talking about biology and not political issues relative to reproductive rights or so on. Um, there's discomfort among the staff because of lifestyle variations, but again, this is something you have to take into account when you have cultural and uh, biological components of disease. And it's difficult to bring up. I don't want the person to feel uncomfortable and want me to be labeled as somebody who's overly sensitive to women's issues. Well, if you have a woman in front of you who has had a hypertensive pregnancy disorder and has hypertension at the age of 45, don't you think you need to bring that up or ask those questions? That's not being overly sensitive to women's issues. That's caring for that patient um, in the best way you can. And then finally, there's bias. And I, you know, some of these concepts overlap. Gender is different from sex. And you know, we have talk about transgender and we have celebrities. It's all in the news. And we don't know what to believe or how to, to um, uh, deal with that. And again, this kind of lacks to education. And then it's not really relevant to my field. I can't imagine what field that might be. Okay, maybe the cornfield in Minnesota. But, you know, I mean, no matter whether you care exclusively for patients, men or women, you know, there's a sex component to that. <clears throat> so you saw this before when I was um, talking about Dr. Jenkins' uh, 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 program, that we really are right here, right now. We have developed this paradigm where we really want sex and gender, scientific discovery, that's you all, and then really develop these programs threading throughout the medical school, okay? So whatever, wherever you touch the uh, patient or the student, it's important to bring up these concepts. So again, for those who weren't here before, 
The Institute of Medicine defines sex as being male or female according to reproductive organs and functions assigned by the chromosomal complement. Sex is biology. Every cell has a sex. You all know that, right? Let's say it together. Every cell has a sex. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You've all heard me before. But you know what? People forget it. What can I say? And here they are. Okay, here's for a female, has two X chromosomes, and the male has an X and a Y. Now, I think it's important for you to kind of bring this concept up to students, you know, in the very beginning of medical school, because they may have learned it in Biology 101 some years ago, but they haven't thought about it since. And it's one of these things that's so obvious that you don't really think about it until you bring it up to, to the mind, especially when you talk about the genes that are associated with those chromosomes. So when we talk about the X and the Y chromosome, this is really the genetic level of where all sex differences begin. This is the sex chromosome effect. Well, let's talk about some of the genes that are on these chromosomes. Here's an X chromosome, and it's rather robust, and this is just a few of the genes. You can find a complete set on these references here that I just picked out to show you that it affects many systems of the body. Now think about it. When there's genetic polymorphisms on this, single X chromosome that males only have one, where is it going to manifest itself more robustly than in a woman that has two? So it's important to think about these concepts, and especially when we talk about cardiovascular regu regulation in terms of uh, some of the receptors and substances that re regulate neurotransmitter release, um, inflammatory remark, remark and restructuring of the, um, of the uh, uh, cardiovascular organs. Now what about this little Y chromosome here that doesn't really have that many genes on it? And I couldn't find a really nice picture of the genes on the Y chromosome on the internet. I looked hard and even asked some of my colleagues. And so this isn't a very good one, but it's the best I could come up with. And we all know that there's a sex determining region um, that's responsible for spermatogenesis on the Y chromosome. But now we know that there's an other groups of genes that are related to uh, coronary artery, artery disease and actually immune signaling, and that some of these genes can express, affect expression on the autosomes. So when we're talking about trying to dismiss the, X, the Y chromosome as just being related to reproduction, I think we really need to rethink that and think about why some of these um, male babies are more vulnerable, as you heard in the um, previous talk. On top of these genes, however, we have hormones that are produced by the reproductive organs, and these are present in both men and women that vary across the lifespan. Now, when we talk about cardiovascular disease, you know, we usually think about maybe this group down here. We don't really think about cardiovascular disease here or here in terms of being uh, how we treat it or where it's presented in the clinic um, based on population prevalence and, and so on. But you really need to think about when we talk about the hormonal influences on the cardiovascular system that it varies across the lifespan. Remember when we talked about the FDA, they want sex and age. Part of age is hormonal status. So in addition to the X and Y chromosome, we have the gonadal effects, which are the hormonal effects, which can be organizational for development of the reproductive or organs, and also the activational effects, which can be short-term and reversible. This is an example, and this is from a, an, an old figure where we talked about the effects of the sex steroids on, on an endothelial cell. But remember, every cell has a sex, so some of these receptors and so on apply to any cell that you might want to consider. We have receptor membrane re receptors, we have um, uh, nuclear receptors and co-regulators which affect transcription and longer kinds of lasting cellular consequences. And again, because every cell has a sex, and, every, and, mo and the cells in the body have steroid receptors and are exposed to the estrogen, and the testosterone, we have sex steroid effects in target tissues for almost every disease or every organ. And I think, I, I love this slide because the biggest, uh, most dramatic activational effect of sex steroid hormones I think is pregnancy. A lot of hormones during pregnancy, once a baby's delivered they go away and some of those effects go away as well. Very dramatic activational effect. Now, men don't do this. We heard this before from Dr. Thornburg. And many of the situations that happen during a woman's pregnancy 
as you heard before, can have lifelong consequences, not only to the baby, but to the mother herself in terms of susceptibility to chronic diseases, cardiovascular disease being um, a group that's affected. So when you think about in teaching material, in terms of basic preclinical and translational science, I like this concept. It's because we have sex-specific genetic and hormonal parameters, we are going to identify and see sex influences on regulatory pathways that lead to sex differences in incidence, prevalence, etiology, symptomatology, response to treatment, morbidity, and mortality in human disease. This affects everything, not just cardiovascular disease. And if you go through the list of diseases in terms of prevalence in society, you can see that there are differences in autoimmune diseases, chronic lung diseases, kidney diseases, bone um, uh, fracture, and outcomes, and so on. So cardiovascular disease is important because it's a major killer of, of people in the Western world. But um, keep in mind that it affects all um, parts of the body. So when we talk about cardiovascular function, a lot of scientists focus on one part. Like they'll focus on the heart, or they'll focus on the endothelial cells, or the blood vessel, or the autonomic nervous system. But when we're talking about cardiovascular disease, it's really an integrative function, right? So we have every cell having a sex, and sex hormones affecting all these components of the cardiovascular system. So how does that play out? Okay, well it plays out in differences in sex-specific conditions. Uh, okay. Men have erectile dysfunction. It's not going to kill you, but it's going to affect your quality of life and may be indicative of more widespread peripheral atherosclerosis. A sex-specific condition in women, on the other hand, hypertensive pregnancy disorders can kill you. Okay. Uh, Vasomotor symptoms of menopause, while maybe not, um, uh, there's debate on whether that increases uh, your risk for cardiovascular disease as you age, clearly affect quality of life as a sex-specific um, response. Then we have those cardiovascular diseases which are sex different. Let's talk about some of those. Systemic hypertension appears at an earlier age in men and women, although women get systemic hypertension as well. There is a sex difference in the prevalence of uh, pulmonary hypertension. And women also have a greater prevalence of Raynaud's disease and postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, or POTS. Now, when you think about some of these symptoms right here, and including vasomotor function um, and hypertension, these all can relate to the autonomic nervous system in some way, as original, in, in addition to the response of the effector organ. So when we think about the etiology of cardiovascular disease, it focuses just on one part of the body, the kidney or the endothelial cell, without taking into account where these uh, factors could be influenced by autonomic function or the brain, I think we're, we're cutting ourselves short. What are some other ones? Well, when we talk about the macro arteries or the larger arteries, we have more occlusive coronary artery disease in men, and we have spontaneous coronary artery dissection in women, which is sometimes related to um, pregnancy or a um, stressful um, uh, experience. When we talk about the microvasculature, women have more microvascular non-occlusive disease than men. And when we talk about the heart remodeling, we have um, more heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in women and apical ballooning or takosubu conditions in women brought about by stressful, mostly a mo lot in postmenopausal women, where we have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction in men and an increased propensity for myocarditis, which brings us back to an Im immunological consequence, which you heard about from Dr. Thornburg. and also relates to those genes we saw on the X and Y chromosome related to immunocompetence. So when we think about cardiovascular disease and teach about sex and gender components, we really need to take a integrative approach. So I'm going to try to go through some of these a little bit here with autonomic function, an example, endothelial cells, vascular and smooth muscle matrix, and blood elements. So let's talk about control of cardiac output. Cardiac output is regulated in both men and women and it reflects both heart rate and stroke volume and changes peripheral um, pressure and total peripheral resistance. 
But females regulate cardiac output more by heart rate than males, where males regulate it more by total per peripheral resistance. So what you can see is the cardiac output is regulated, and it's regulated the same in, in I mean, it's regulated both in men and women, but you get to it by different ways. This is really important because when you're talking about independent sex biasing factors, they can oppose each other, okay? You can get to an effect. Males and females can get there, but by different paths. And I think this is really important because when you look at most of the molecular studies that are done to identify molecular pathways of cardiovascular disease, and they only look at men, male animals, those regulations of those pathways, which we hear about ad nauseum all the time, NF-kappa B and oxidative stress, so on and so on, that may be true, but those regulatory processes that increase oxidative stress, increase inflammation, or increase production of the uh, endothelium-derived factors may be different in men and women based on sex, age, and hormonal status. So here's an example from Emma Hart's work where she looked at young men and looked at total peripheral resistance with mean um, uh, muscle sympathetic nerve activity. And this is a nice linear relationship. I learned this when I was in school how many years ago. This was a classic textbook thing. You increase sympathetic nerve activity, you increase total peripheral resistance. We all know that. Except when she started looking at young women that were age matched. And what did she see? There's an outlier down here, but if you look at these right here, you don't really see a positive linear relationship there, do you? So again, we have muscle, muscle sympathetic nerve activity, which not is really relating to total peripheral resistance. But we do if we study women that are menopause age. So from a young woman that has a lot of estrogen going on here, and a postmenopausal woman, you begin to see this um, uh, uh, linear relationship again. What happens if you block beta receptors? Well, if you block beta receptors in young women, you see a linear response. Not so much, uh, it goes with the significance is barely significant in the postmenopausal women, but it's kind of still there, but not very dramatic from what happened before. This is a big switch from 0.2 to 0.5. In other words, we have an effect of the sex steroids, estrogen, on beta adrenergic sensitivity. Okay, so that's going to vary across the lifespan, and do you think it might impact how women may change their response to beta adrenergic drugs or uh, antagonists across the lifespan, which are used for some uh, cardiovascular disease? In addition, estrogen can modulate production of catecholamines, uptake of neurotransmitter um, in the cells, and metabolism of the catecholamines by, reg or, or by regulating catechol methyltransferase, some of these metabolites of which have their own uh, biological activity. So when we're looking at the influence of sex hormones on autonomic function across the lifespan, we have to take into account not only sympathetic nerve activity as it might be regulated from the brain, but also metabolism of the neurotransmitter in the periphery. Some of the physiological consequences of this is that arrhythmias are more prevalent in women than men, and AFib is more prevalent in men compared to women. Well, what about the endothelial cells? We talked about the autonomic nervous system, and this is a study we did many years ago. This is an alpha-2 adrenergic agonist. These were rings of porcine coronary artery in an organ bath. And here's the response of the rings with endothelium from uh, sexually mature male pigs and sexually mature female pigs. And you can see that this relaxation to this alpha-2 agonist is greater in the females. If we block this response with endomethacin, we see that there is a significantly greater increase in the um, dilation of this blood vessel in males compared to females, suggesting that these males are producing a contract-off substance by the cyclooxygenase pathway. We don't see that in the females, but if we give a substance that also blocks nitric oxide, we see from once we block those prostanoids, we see that the relaxation is pretty much the same. So when we're talking about endothelium-dependent relaxations in this particular system, we're talking about really sex hormones modulating the cyclooxygenase or maybe other uh, enzymes downstream of that. Um, but we also know that the sex steroids affect angiotensin um, 
converting enzyme inhibitor, production of the natri atrial natriuretic peptides, nitric oxide, and production of free radicals. So when we talk about endothelial function within the vasculature, there's multiple points at which the sex hormones can impact, and when you take the sex hormones away, you would uncover then the effects of just um, sex by itself. So we've talked about how, um, remember, every cell can have a sex. So we've talked about the autonomic nervous system and some of the neurotransmitters. We've talked about the endothelial cells. Let's now talk about um, uh, uh, the um, uh, muscle itself. I'm not going to talk about uh, vascular smooth muscle, but I'm going to talk about cardiac smooth muscle. And this is a slide compliments of George Caragas from Charité in Berlin, where he obtained um, biopsy samples from patients that had um, aortic stenosis um, with either preserved, with preserved ejection fraction. And you can see that this dark blue here is actually where the collagen um, is deposited. And you can see that there's much more deposition of this collagen in the male patients than in the female hearts. Now, he went on to show not only the collagen, but many other pathways associated with collagen deposition and structure of the heart. And when you think about it, that a woman's heart has to be able to adapt to the cardiac output load of a pregnancy and be modified, you would expect it maybe, you would expect perhaps there's different regulation of the collagen and matrix associated with that change in terms of a um, uh, activational effect of the hormones. And what about platelets in coagulation? Well, platelets in the circulation have a half-life of about um, 10 to 12 days. So they constantly turn over. So if you have platelets that are going to be produced in a hormone-rich environment, you're really reflecting inside that little platelet, that activated sac as it floats around the um, uh, vascular system, those materials that were produced under the genomic effects of the sex steroids on the megakaryocyte. So if you're looking at platelets from a hormone replete animal or person, they may have more reactive substances or different reactive substances if it was a hormone deplete individual, same of whether it was estrogen rich or testosterone rich. And when these platelets are activated, the, the uh, ability of those cells to be activated and the things that they release are going to affect not only vascular tone, but also vascular remodeling. Because when you go back to the early work of Russell Ross with the platelet uh, contribution of development of atherosclerosis, the platelet and platelet-derived growth factor was all over it, okay? So we can't diminish this kind of um, control system in cells that turn over so rapidly. So what happens? We were, um, uh, but platelets don't exist alone in the circulation, and other um, cellular elements are also produced in the bone marrow and, other, uh, and have effect of both um, non-genomic and genomic effects. And when they're in the circulation, they interact with each other. Not only do they interact with each other, but they shed bleeps of membrane from um, their, their cell surface called microvesicles. And these microvesicles can adhere to the endothelial cells, they can adhere to other cells, and transport the material that is held within that membrane-bound sac. So we were interested in trying to define how this activated vascular compartment might change under different conditions in relationship to progression of atherosclerosis and coronary calcification in women especially women who have had a history of uh, hypertensive pregnancy. So you can see, we, me we measured a lot of things. We had actually 38 parameters that we were measuring, but based on some of our earlier work, we were able to sort that down to about 13, which we kept showing up in various analysis that we did. So in order to, instead of doing a single analysis of, you know, a monocyte-derived uh, microvesicles with um, coronary calcification or carotidentimal thickness, we used a statistical approach called um, principal components analysis, which really takes all of those components together to find the relationship. And when we did that, uh, we found the following. What did we look at? We looked at coronary artery calcification in women that had either a normotensive pregnancy or a hypertensive pregnancy, and we looked at them 35 years later when they were um, estrogen deplete. 
If you're not used to looking at this, this is a CT scan of the heart. The feet are coming out at you, so the left is over here. And here we don't have any coronary calcium in there, but here we've got a little bit, and here we've got a big hunk of calcium here, which for many studies have been shown that this calcium can be related to the incidence of myocardial infarction. The MESA study and um, Matt Butoff's work um, showed that. So what did our principal components analysis find? These are the parameters that we put in the variables that we put in our analysis. Factors related to coagulation, cell adhesion, and specific, cell-specific, cell-derived microvesicles. And what we found that in women that had a coronary, uh, a preeclamptic pregnancy, that the contribution of um, pro uh, procoagulant factors, cell adhesion molecules, and of all things, adipocyte-derived microvesicles correlated in, with the calcification in these women with preeclampsia, a history of preeclampsia, but with not with normal tense of pregnancies. We were really interested in this because there's also data out there that shows that the presence of coronary calcium is related to the amount of adipose tissue around the, the coronary arteries. So when we found this relationship with adipocytes, we can begin to look at these kinds of parameters to see, one, how, when does this activation start relative to the woman's pregnancy experience, and how does it change across the lifespan, and how can we intervene early in order to stop some of these processes. So if we've heard multiple times before, we have biological influences on the development of health and disease and outcome. Sex we're focusing on. We talked about age and a hormonal status and reproductive status, which typically is not in an intake form for women when they go to the doctor. They ask you how many pregnancies you had, how many live births, but they do not ask you have you had any adverse events with those pregnancies. And we're now trying to change the intake form to make sure we get that information in there. And then we heard a lot, even from Dr. Thornburg's uh, presentation, about how these other environmental factors or gender influences or cultural influences can impact the biology through epigenetic uh, changes across generations. So when we take information for our studies, what do we need to take and report? Okay? For sure we need to report in basic science variables, sex, okay? NIH now requires you to do that. We used to do it back when I was in graduate school, and somehow with impact factor, it got lost along the way. Age, hormonal status, you know, is your caging in terms of stress of your animals? What's the temperature, food, and light cycle? And now there's some evidence that the pheromones of the handler may also affect the stress of your uh, little mouse and some of the uh, outcomes that you're measuring. The clinical demographics, sex, maybe gender, but components of gender we're already taking into account when we talk about habitation, geographical location, um, income, and education. And I had one slide with diet on here, and I don't know where it went, but um, for sure diet. Right, Dr. Thornburg? Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry I left that out. These are typically reported in clinical studies. Um, sometimes not always reported by the sex of the, um, of the uh, dichotomized by sex, though, of the, of the studies. Now, I wanted to leave you with resources, okay? Now, I know this is a lot for you to take in, but when I said, you know, how can you incorporate these concepts into how you're teaching? And I can't expect you to take all these slides and put, it, put them into a lecture and how, what your specific needs are. These will be on the um, web material if you go on the, the resources afterwards. Um, and I think that this new uh, book by Gretchen Nye um, is really nice, uh, a lot of physiology in that. There's a lot of articles about how to study sex differences. And this, um, this is a great one here, this new uh, physiological review article specifically looking at mechanistic pathways of sex differences in cardiovascular disease is a really nice one, and it's new, 19, 2017. I suggest you take a look at that one. Um, there's web-based courses. We talked about some of those with, um, uh, in Dr. Jenkins' talk, especially those provided by um, Texas Tech. But I also want to show you this learning module that the Canadian Institute of Health Research puts out. And this is, a, this is cool. I think this will work. And there it is, okay? What is beautiful about this, it's free, okay? And there are three, three modules. Oh, it's not showing up? How come? Hmm. Shows up here. <laughs> 
Why isn't it showing up there? <laughs> Alrighty. This is where we were having trouble before. Um, thank you for telling me that. Okay. There we can go up here. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Bizarre. Honestly, it worked at 7.30 this morning. Now I've lost everything. Oh. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> I've lost everything. I'm sorry to end this this way. Now I can't get anything back. Anyway, go on to that website. There are three modules. The first one is basic science of sex differences. The second one relates to animal studies. Um, and um, uh, the third one relates to human studies. The beauty of those um, uh, modules is that they show you grants that were submitted to the Canadian um, Health Research Center, specifically those sections of the grant that have to deal with incorporating concepts of sex and gender. So if you're struggling with those concepts, um, uh, in your, you know, with you're writing your own grants or you're running workshops for students writing those grants, I direct all my students here and say, take this first before you come and we talk about what you're putting in your grant. Each one takes about 30 minutes if you're pretty savvy at some of the stuff. I can never pass the human one because I don't understand all the statistical things, but I figure that's okay. I have a statistician to help me with that. But, you know, it's a really useful tool. You can give it to your students and incorporate some of this material into, the, into your classroom as well. Now let's see if I can get back to this. Huh. Uh, do you want to close all tabs? No. Uh, close only this one. Let's see. Always close all tabs. You want to close all tabs? Close all. No, I don't want to close all. I only want to close that one. Um, sex and gender learning. <laughs> That's, it's like, okay. I'm sorry. Hold on. Let's see what happens. There we go. Okay, let's see now. Okay, so in conclusion, I would suggest you go to that site and try it out. So, in conclusion, I had some learning objections for you. First of all, I think you now can articulate the rationale for embedding concepts of sex and gender into physiology curriculum because it affects every kind of cardiovascular disease you might want to study. Um, we can define sex and gender. Sex is biology. Gender is everything else. If that's a simple definition and if you use that, it's good. And every cell has a sex. Thank you. We achieved that learning objective for some of you, anyway. I think you can list three examples of how sex influences the cardiovascular control mechanism, one through the autonomic nervous system, the endothelial cells, the actual structure of the heart and blood vessels, um, and the uh, blood elements. And finally, I develop a, a lesson plan that incorporates these concepts into what you're teaching in cardiovascular physiology. That's your homework, okay? And I'm giving you the tools to do that. And I think you are in the position to really to transform physiology education. Because you touch these students, and, I mean, at the undergraduate level, before they even think about going to medical school, many of you. And if you start there and they hear it again and again, they are really going to start to think differently, not only about their science, but also their patients. And they should look through not only their science, but also um, their research through a sex and gender lens. Thank you very much.